Welcome to your lecture on the other senses. We've previously spoken about vision and hearing, and while all of our senses are important, those two are probably the most important. And then we get into things like our sense of touch. Your sense of touch is going to be comprised of four distinct skin senses. Pressure, which will have its own identifiable receptors, warmth, cold, and pain. In the past, we talked about a homunculus, a representation in the brain of your body that's mapped out on your motor cortex and your somatosensory cortex. We know that areas that are have greater mobility or are more sensitive take up more space. And interestingly enough, the cells that respond to our sense of touch, well, they have receptive fields that vary in size, much like that center surround organization that you would have found on the back of your retina. Additionally, our body is constantly, constantly being impacted by tactile or touch sensation, whether it's the pressure of the clothes on your body or the fact that you might be sitting somewhere listening to this lecture. That means that pressure is being consistently and constantly applied to your body. Well, once you sit down in the chair and you've maintained your balance, we stop paying attention to the pressure message of the body weight on our legs. We stop paying attention to the pressure message of our clothing on our body. We experience sensory adaptation because if we didn't, our brains would be flooded with tactile information. When we look at something like touch, you have four identifiable skin sensations with pressure having its own identifiable receptors. Pressure, warmth, cold, and pain in different combinations make up every single thing that you feel. So the question is, if you can experience all of that, how do we get to things like hot? And the reality is, is that if you've ever gone outside in the winter, played in the snow for a while, got really cold hands and feet, and then came inside, if you wanted to warm up, you could run your hands under water. What you wouldn't do is turn on really hot water. The difference between your skin's actual temperature and the heat of really hot water would just be so great that it would be painful. But if you put on lukewarm water, the difference between the cold skin and the warm water, the jump would be great enough for you to determine that the water felt hot. And that's essentially what's going on. It's a variation or a volume between cold and warm that allows us to determine that something is hot. Pain is probably your greatest teacher. Throughout your life, if something has hurt you, you've learned very quickly not to do it again. It tells us that something's gone wrong. And that's not just pain like you broke a leg or you bumped into something. It's the pain that you get from having a sore throat, letting yourself know that you have an infection. It usually results from damage to the skin or other tissues, but there is a rare disease where a person doesn't have any pain receptors. Now, this might seem like that person should then become a superhero, but unfortunately, people with this disorder tend to have very short lives and tend to have some pretty, pretty big drawbacks. Think of how many times as a child you twisted an ankle or fell down and, and hurt yourself. And if you were me, I've broken plenty of bones. Without pain, you could continue to cause greater internal damage. Think of the times that you called to your parents to let them know that you were too ill to go to school because you felt pain. So it is important that you have this teacher. We have two pathways for pain, and they do differ. You have a fast message pathway and a slow message pathway, and it is kind of important that we have both of those. Your fast message pathway is going to have A delta fibers, and they're myelinated. So again, with that fatty coating around the axon, the messages travel faster. The second, that slow pathway, well, that's gonna come from C fibers, and they're unmyelinated. So it's more of the throbbing pain, the reason we have these two different pathways is the first one tells us to, hey, stupid, stop. Stop whatever it is that you're doing right this moment. While the C pathway, that gives you that consistent message of it's still injured, it's still injured, it's still injured. One gets you to recognize the damage and attend to it right away, and the other one is just kind of your reminder. It's still there and it still hurts. Then we have interesting things like when we bump our heads, why do we rub the area we bumped? Well, there's two reasons for it. 
we can go back to that idea of where our receptive cells are for our sense of touch and knowing that they vary in their size when we rub them we start sending other sensory messages to the brain which can disrupt the firing of the pain message the second one has to do with the next theory that we're going to talk about which is called the pain gate theory now I mentioned that we are going to go and talk about why rubbing your head works with the pain gate theory and we will come back to that but before we do that let's talk about perception of pain this is the psychological element of pain one if you believe that you're not supposed to feel pain or that it's pain that you can deal with you may not feel as much if you have an expectation whether it's an expectation of pain relief like in pregnancy that it will be over at some point or expectation that it's really 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 gonna hurt you can either increase or decrease your pain your personality people who internalize more people who tend to be more self-reflective sometimes they feel more pain if you can be easily distracted well you might not notice the pain as much your mood I don't know about you guys but anytime I've ever been sad or cranky if I've hurt myself at that time it's hurt worse and there is a reason for that some of its perception and some of its serotonin and cultural differences in pain tolerance your culture can set up your expectation for pain as well and some cultures well they just don't allow certain people like in our culture men or certain events in some other cultures childbirth for the people to experience really extreme pain so your culture can have an impact psychologically on how you experience your pain other things can actually distract you from pain so so you hit your thumb with a hammer and all of a sudden you hear your child scream or cry and it's not a not a big deal scream it's one of those ones where you realize something really bad has happened you will forget that pain the same thing happens with athletes if you get hurt in a regular game you may get taken off the field but if you get hurt in like the big game whether it's a championship game or a playoff game you might not experience the pain as deeply as you are distracted and you have a focus on something more important there's a ton of biopsychosocial influences and when we say biopsychosocial we're talking about biological psychological and social cultural biopsychosocial approaches are really kind of the most modern blended approaches in psychology it takes into account that biology the way that you are genetically constructed plus your mental kind of capacity your attention your thoughts your feelings and the presence of others well all of those things they create the experience of pain so your biological influences we'll talk about the pain gate theory some people produce more endorphins those natural neurotransmitters that release are release of pain in the brain or just how your central nervous system reacts in general well that can have part of an impact but you have to add into that that's psychological are you paying attention have you had the experience before and you know that it'll end do you have an expectation of pain relief well all of that can change whether or not you experience pain and then there's also those other social cultural influences other people around well ever watch a little kid get hurt if other people pay attention they might actually cry and feel more pain but if everyone acts like it's no big deal well then they might feel like it's not that painful empathy for others may actually cause you your own pain and like I said before there's the cultural expectations so now we're back to the when you bump uh, uh, your head and you rub it it disrupts the signal well let's switch it for the pain gate theory since it involves our spinal column to I don't know knocking your leg into the corner of a table which I do all the time so I'm walking and I don't judge corners clearly and I knock right into the corner of a table and the corner is going to cause a very specific location of pain and so I'm going to start to rub that area well the pressure is going to disrupt the message but the question is why and gate control theory says that your spinal column acts as the gateway to your brain that gateway either allows messages to the brain or it can shut them down small messages can make it to the brain small messages about pressure can make it to the brain large messages might actually shut the gate remember we talked before about how you have those a delta fibers those thick myelinated fibers well 
If too many of them activate, they can shut the gate to the brain. Too much pain and the brain might decide that it can't deal with it. But small fibers, like those of pressure, can still pass through and still make it to the brain. So when we're looking at the gate control theory, if you have a very, very, very extreme pain response to an event, those large fibers may actually shut the gate to the brain, while smaller fibers will allow messages to continue through. Okay, so here you have a broken ankle and it's broken. Um, me and my husband were climbing Old Rag a long, long time ago. Um, I don't know, maybe eight years ago. And as we were hiking, it was a really, really crowded day on the mountain. And we heard someone scream. A couple of minutes later, we saw someone looking really frazzled and nervous and rather kind of just freaked out run by. And my husband stepped out and asked him if he was okay. Now, we'll talk about that again when we get into social psychology. But the guy had told us that his friend fell and that he needed help. And my husband and I both having first responder training, my husband having more first responder training, being a part of the SWAT team, said that, you know, he could come and see what he could do. So he hiked on ahead and I got there a little bit later. Well, the young woman didn't do anything crazy. She was actually just going the wrong way down the mountain. So if you've ever climbed Old Rag, you can go up one area that's called the Rock Scramble and down the fire road. The fire road is nice and paved. Well, they came up the fire road and were going the other way down the mountain and they were going over the Rock Scramble. Well, she was dropping from a boulder, maybe no more than 10 feet in height. And with her body fully extended, it was probably maybe a four foot drop. So nothing crazy. She just landed wrong and literally snapped her ankle, as you can see. Well, when I met Julia, she was under a thermal blanket and absolutely calm as can be. No tears, no screaming, no crying. And I asked her if I could take this photo because, I mean, this is insane. And she said, sure. And we were able to do things like capillary refill, squeeze her toes to make sure that no major arteries were damaged. And so we could see that blood was flowing in and flowing out. We were able to talk to her. And the only time, the only time she ever mentioned any pain is if she tried to adjust where her body was positioned. Otherwise, the gate was closed. The pain messages were not going to her brain. This was too intense a pain for her to actually deal with it. So her brain shut it down. This means that the pain message had to be processed by the brain once. It got there. Got there quick enough for her to go, oh no, let's not put it any weight on this. She immediately laid down. She didn't move from where she was. And that was that. Now, the sad part of this story is that Julia still had to get off the mountain. And since she was on the other side of the fire road, she either needed to get a helicopter or she needed to find another way down the mountain. Well, it was too windy for a helicopter to airlift her out. So we ended up having to wait for a ranger to come with a lot of morphine. Her body was not gonna produce enough endorphins to get over that amount of pain. They had to literally get her as high as possible and then they had to take her down the mountain in a wheelbarrow. We left before that happened, um, but this is just a really kind of insane example of how your brain can deal with pain. Like I mentioned in that previous example, endorphins, well, those are our neural pain suppressors. Those are the neurotransmitters that are responsible for the suppression of pain in our central nervous system. Additionially, however, we have learned that glia cells, those support cells, the ones that seem to help us build myelin sheath and shuttle out excess waste and bring in nutrients, well, the glia cells in our spinal column used to actually be thought to be just additional support cells now appear to play an active role in what we call chronic pain. So we think that they may actually irritate or egg on or kind of influence the firing of pain in your nerve cells, which does give some credence and some explanation to pain-based disorders like fibromyalgia, where a person doesn't have an outside physical reason for pain, but their brain and their body experiences really intense pain. Well, that's coming from these glial cells irritating nearby pain cells, and they send pain messages even though there should be no pain. 
Opioid peptides are short sequences of amino acids that mimic the effect of opiates in the brain. Those are another form of natural painkiller. There's some interesting things with pain, like strangely enough, if you use curse words after being hurt, it can actually psychologically diminish the amount of pain you feel, not encouraging you to cuss, but it is scientifically proven. Also, if you can use your vision, now I don't think most of us go running around with a pair of binoculars, but you know, I don't know if you're accident prone, maybe this is something you should start doing. But if you were to flip them and reverse them and look through them, if you were to hurt a limb like your hand or your foot, and then look through the reverse binoculars, your vision would actually detach the pain message. It would make you feel like the hand or the foot was too far away to physically be your own, and you might feel less pain or no pain. Pain control can come through a whole number of different ways. Some of it can be drugs, so I think all of us have taken an anti-inflammatory or an Advil or something like that to help with pain. It can come from things like surgery, I had a torn rotator cuff and I needed to get surgery to fix it because the pain without the tendons being attached properly was pretty great. Acupuncture. We do have a tendency to think of things like uh, Eastern medicines as maybe not as effective. Acupuncture really has a lot of research and backing for an effective measure, but it's not just getting needles shoved into your skin. Acupuncture is a holistic medicine, meaning that you address things like your sleep schedule, what you eat, how you exercise, and you look at different pinpoints of nerve cells. Exercise. A strong body, a healthy body, is usually a body that's better at dealing with pain. Hypnosis, a divided consciousness, can also help, and sometimes distracted thought can help. So pain control can come from a variety of ways. Now we're moving on to our next sense of taste, and you should know that this is called your gustatory system. When we're talking about it, it used to be that we talked about four different sensations of taste, sweet, sour, salty, bitter. And now we have a fifth called umami, which was discovered by the Japanese, and this is supposed to be savory. As recently as the 90s, we used to believe that your tongue had different patches for your sense of taste bitter being in the very back, sweet and salty on the tip of your tongue, maybe sour to the sides and not really a whole lot in the dead center. And what we've learned over time is that that's just wrong. Your taste buds are distributed throughout your mouth, primarily on your tongue, but you have taste receptors in other parts. The cells that absorb the chemicals are your taste buds. So for you to taste something, you first have to mash it down into a liquidy, goo because it actually the chemicals in the food have to get dissolved in the saliva those taste buds detect the chemicals in your saliva and it'll trigger a neural impulse to be sent to the thalamus the thalamus will then send it back to the insular cortex of your frontal lobe so your sense of taste is in your frontal lobe but it travels deep into your thalamus because that neural impulse has to be detected by that structure before it can be processed in the frontal lobe Culture influences taste. Now we have biological preferences for things like sweet and salty. Salty helps with neural firing because we need that sodium potassium pump to function, so we need electrolytes. Well, sweet, sweet means calories and calories mean survival. But then there's also nurture. There's cultural preferences for things. If you go to environments that are closer to the equator, well, their food is usually spicier because like we'll talk about in a little bit, spices allowed them to kill different bacteria that would have been on meat and food. Well, if you go to other cultures, they had other ways of preserving or creating food, and you may just enjoy that food because that's the culture you're from. So I always find it funny that peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are an American food. I just assumed that everybody ate peanut butter and jelly and that it was just a normal thing. But if you travel overseas, you go to the UK, they think our like fascination with peanut butter and especially peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are on the whole pretty disgusting. It's a cultural preference. I grew up with a very German side to my mom's side of the family and we ate sauerkraut all the time. Now my children and my husband all find it absolutely disgusting. I love sauerkraut. But again, while this kind of goes back to my own personal upbringing, you can see how environment influences what feels like 
home food, what feels like familiar and comfort food, and what you've learned to like. We have different types of sensitivity to taste throughout a population. We have about a quarter of the population that we call super tasters, and they have a quarter as many taste buds per square centimeter as what we would call super tasters, meaning that they're just not that sensitive to taste and they really can eat pretty much anything. Kind of think of these as the people that if you suggest a weird food, they're gonna immediately be like, sure, I'll try it. Because probably it's not gonna bother them that much. Then another quarter of the population is what we call super tasters. Super tasters are really, really super sensitive to taste. They're more likely to be fond of things that have sugar and high fat um, because it's gonna be pleasing and really more negative towards anything like that has a bitter or um, maybe even an acidic taste to it. Um, they may find certain vegetables really, really appalling just because they have kind of a bitter aftertaste. They also will be really sensitive to things like alcohol and smoke. Women more often than men will be super tasters and that goes back to an evolutionary discussion about hunter-gatherers. Men didn't have to taste the animals that they killed because they just killed them. So pretty much a guarantee that they were fresh. But the women who were out gathering, well, they had to taste the berries. They had to taste the things that they were gathering to ensure that one, they weren't poisonous, two, they were ripe. And so it is a little bit more likely that you'll find women to be super tasters. And then there's the rest of the 50% of us who are just kind of run of the mill in the middle. We do have sensory interaction, and this is important to look at because our senses, whether it's our sense of smell and our sense of taste, our sense of vision and our sense of balance, these things interact to give us our full experience. So flavor is probably the easiest thing. We tend to think of flavor as the food that hits your tongue, but the reality is flavor is what you smell plus what you taste. Those two chemical interactions, they create your entire experience. If you have a cold or you can't smell very well, the taste of food becomes kind of muted. Synesthesia, we'll look at this video in class, but synesthesia is a cross wiring of the senses. With something like synesthesia, what you are getting is most likely we think it's at the thalamus. The thalamus isn't routing information properly. And so your senses get blended. You might see something and that vision comes with a haze of a specific color. You might hear something and it gives you a tingle or a sensation of a certain taste. You might touch something and that touch registers in an auditory, a taste or a visual kind of sensation that's blended in with it. Smell is the one sense that doesn't go to your thalamus. So you do not route your sense of smell through your thalamus. So like taste, it is a chemical sense. It has far more chemicals it can detect. So 5 million receptors for the sense of smell. And this highly, highly interacts with your sense of taste to give you things like the flavor of food. That's why you can kind of smell something and almost taste it from the particles in the air. What's active in your sense of smell or your olfactory sense is going to be your olfactory bulb. And this is deep within your nasal passage. The olfactory receptors that you can see there in that membrane, well, you don't want to have dry sinuses because it will kill your sense of smell. You need a nice kind of moist, sticky sinus. And the chemical odorants, those chemicals in the air, will actually stick. It'll activate the sensory cells and it'll go directly to that olfactory bulb in your brain. Just a couple more quick facts about your sense of smell or your olfactory sense. As much as this is important, it's just going to be said again. Your olfactory sense does not go through your thalamus. It goes directly to your brain. Anosmia is what happens when you lack your sense of smell. And so this can happen from a variety of different ways, um, but it can be temporary or permanent. So if you are, say, a cigarette smoker, that can actually diminish your sense of smell by taking in all of those carcinogens and the smoke. But often when smokers stop, their sense of smell recovers and they start to taste things again. You just shouldn't smoke, it's disgusting. Then there's pheromones. And pheromones are going to be chemical signals that trigger natural responses in species. But here's the crazy thing, we're humans. We don't really like the natural scent of things. We like the smell of soap and soap. We really like soap and maybe 
cologne or body spray or whatever. So we don't necessarily find our mates based off of their scent at all. Don't buy any perfume or cologne that says we'll attract the opposite sex because we've added pheromones. That's just not true. But there are a couple of things like there is something called the menstrual synchrony effect, which is that women, if they live together long enough, will most likely get on the same kind of monthly menstrual cycle. And it is a reaction to the pheromones that they produce. When we look at age, as you get older, your sense of smell starts to diminish. When we look at gender, well, women tend to have a more sensitive sense of smell than men. Now the question is why? And the answer comes from an evolutionary background. Women would have wanted to have a delicate sense of smell because most plants, when they ripen, they produce a smell. And if you could detect it, you could probably find a food source. The other thing is less desirable, but still really necessary for health. And that is we can smell poop. Yep, poop. So your child, before it can speak, wets itself or poops. And it's a really good indication for you to remove the feces from your living area because you don't want to live around poop. And they probably didn't have indoor plumbing. And two, you want to clean the skin to ensure that no infection sets in. So by detecting it and being able to smell it and being able to clean it, you keep your infant from rolling in its own poop or sitting in its own poop. So it's poop. Smell is highly, highly linked to memory and that is because a lot of the neural connections for your ability to remember have to travel through the region of the brain that detects smell. So if smell triggers a memory, that's why those areas are highly interconnected. The last two things we need to talk about, people don't always normally think of as your senses, but they are in fact senses. One is called your kinesthetic sense and the other one is your vestibular sense. Your kinesthetic sense is your ability to know where your body parts are at any time without having to use your vision. This is a relay system from your tendons to your brain mapping out where your body is. Your vestibular sense, well, that's your ability to maintain balance. And that's a combination between your vision, your semicircular canals in your ear, and your cerebellum. Your vestibular sense is what gives you your body positioning with respect to gravity. In other words, we're bipedal, we stand upright, we wanna have balance. It lets us know that our heads especially are in position with our bodies and it's affected by those semicircular canals. If you remember, the semicircular canals have kind of three orientations, vertical, horizontal, and a 45 degree angle. And there's fluid in those canals. When you do something like spin, well, that fluid moves within those areas. And if you come to an abrupt stop, the fluid continues to move, causing you to have that kind of wobbly, unbalanced feeling. Your kinesthetic sense literally is this feedback from your muscles to your brain, muscles, tendons, whatever. And it lets your brain know where your body is positioned. So those receptors are gonna be sending messages that are processed in the parietal lobe, that area where we have our body map. And it lets us know in our kind of world whether or not our arm is going to fly into the door when we try to pass through a doorway, or whether or not without having to fully look at our body, we could pass through without hitting anything. It literally is our body map.